So if you could again tell us like a story or, you know, just tell us about a time that a part of your identity was not seen. Ooh. Hashtag all the time. <laughs> um, yeah, so it's funny because like whenever I talk about like being unseen or even seen, it's like kind of like there's no necessarily a differentiation between the two, right? Because like sometimes I have to make the decision of like whether or not I'm being uh, which identity do I want to advocate first? Um, I think that's the reason why it's so important that we talk about intersectionality by Dr. Kimberly Crenshaw, um, because of the fact that oftentimes we are not just leaving uh, or using one identity forward and not like talking about that one identity. We need to talk about like the various uh, intersections of identity. Um, so when I haven't been feeling seen, uh, oftentimes it's about like my Asian experience with the intersections of my mental health, right? Because again, when we talk about resources within the city, um, I have anxiety and depression, but like oftentimes there's not a lot of statistics that focuses on the Asian experience and how, um, how what are the factors that actually influences that, right? Um, the low pay, pay wages, um, oftentimes there's no representation of um, Asian elders in our field or maybe there's just not a lot of um, awareness about it and like where why are we trending when like someone had died right or, or like for example the Indianapolis uh, events and the Atlanta event like it shouldn't have to ha uh, our awareness or at least um, conversation about our identity should be brought up after something that, that like that to happen um yeah because I remembered when uh like when I was trying to just start working as an adult, right? Um, oftentimes people were like, you are doing great, you're doing amazing. And I was like, I'm struggling right now. I'm actually really much in pain. And you may be seeing like, I'm doing good. That's because I'm trying to um, be productive. I'm trying to be the good Asian. I'm trying to get, work really hard to get a higher wage, right? Because I'm currently not making enough uh, to survive, um, to even support my family. Um, even within academia itself, when I was a college student, there was not a lot of programming that focuses on my Asian experience. Um, or even when we talk about first generation students, Asians weren't necessarily represented, um, or even my religious identity. There was just not a lot of spaces that to explore all of these things. Um, and so that made it really difficult for me to see or even feel like I've been seen. Um, when I was younger, I didn't really feel appreciated or like feel seen in a lot of different spaces because in my um, in my family, I was only seen as Gwen Hung, the the child who's kind of weird, right? Um, and my Asianness was the only thing that they saw, or maybe my Asian being coded as a woman, um, because my parents were trying to make sure that I was. Uh, going to college they wanted me to, I was the eldest of my family so I was expected to um, be the one who set examples who uh, finish my degree and then have children and then get married not in that order obviously um, but like yeah that was the expectation for me and um, uh, I didn't necessarily see a lot of that uh, in other spaces there wasn't even representation of, um, of that on TV either so it was just like well I don't really know how I'm gonna do this um, but yeah uh, in terms of that uh, even here in Austin I don't see a lot of representation either uh, or even uh, conversations about the Asian experience that is to par where other communities in other states are having it or other pockets um, which I think is really sad because then it leaves out for other folks as well and even like um, the next generation of folks who are trying to figure out like what does this mean by stop Asian hate Um, if I was in um, POC spaces, I was seen as a person of color, but not a person, not enough to be a person of color. Um, and they didn't know how to really talk about like what does xenophobia looks like in terms of uh, towards me and what racism looks like. Um, oftentimes they were giving me backhanded compliments that I was like, oh, I didn't think that's okay, but I'm not sure. I don't feel good about it. Um, and I didn't understand what that meant until I grew up. I grew up. Um, a lot of 
white spaces I don't often feel comfortable in um, even in queer spaces it's predominantly white um, and again it's like very isolating sometimes because you're not sure how you fit into the space um, however again going back to like individual people there have been individual allies who are non-asian who are asian um, who are viet or non-viet who are like yo i may not necessarily can connect with you with certain things but i know that i can connect you with uh, on a different place and i want to give you a space to be able to talk about your experience even if i don't know what that means and that's what i think is really important is that even if you don't know try to create that space try to learn and um, that's one of the few times where I've ever felt like I have been supported and um, being able to hold uh, solidarity with somebody else. So I went to Texas State uh, for my master's program or graduate program and I worked with um, the the office was called um, a student of diversity inclusions office and um, when I got there um, I was interviewing for a graduate assistantship and like the uh, supervisor was like, hey, my name is Jesse Silva and this is my pronouns and I and then tell me how I can pronounce your name and I was like, okay, <laughs> um, you can just call me Quinn, right? And that was the name I was going by when I was in uh, uh, undergrad. Um, when I was in, when I, before that, I went by Pauline, which is uh, a whole other story in itself. Um, when he said that, I was like, I stopped for a second and I felt seen for the first time. It was like a whole sentence and I was just like, wait a minute, you can totally call me Quinn. And he was like, no, 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 I want to know how to say your full name. And I was like, wow, that's the first time. Because my friends, when I told them like, hey, I've been thinking about going to back to Quinn Hung as my name. And they would say some stuff that did, they don't think that it was a backhanded compliment or maybe kind of like invalidating my experience or decisions um, but when he was able to say that to me I was able to see felt seen in that space and he was able to introduce me to a number of different people and they became my mentors and elders like Dr. Ben, uh, Ms. Wilson, Dr. Silva, Karina and Neha all these wonderful people who were like you know I'm gonna spend some time to challenge you but also I want you to embrace your identity and I was like all right and that helped me understand um, what does self-love and self-compassion look like. There is a book, uh, uh, Asian American um, Reckoning, uh, or Asian American Experience Reckoning, and it's written by Kathy uh, Park Hong, I think. And she talks about it in a perspective, like, as an Asian Korean woman, what does my narrative look like and how has my narrative and perspective in critical analysis uh, creates and also uplift our own community as a narrative but at the same time what is limiting in the storytelling that is often being placed right um, and so she brings up the co good conversation about like how Ocean Vuong is a Vietnamese immigrant queer uh, Asian right but oftentimes his queerness is often left behind from the narrative um, which is uh, very uh, important right and that's like one of the few times where I've seen like people have really rep uh, kind of showed representation of my own identity in like something that is like written in academia or books or anything like that. Uh, within the queer community itself, we have this term called chosen family, and if for folks who may not know, chosen family is another alternative for a lot of folks who are part of the queer community and their blood relatives or their relatives who are related to them by blood uh, may have disowned them, kicked them out, um, and so they have to develop their own sense of community, um, i.e. chosen family, right? Um, and I've come to really explore a lot about that because I never had a really close relationship with my family when I was younger. Now it's a lot different now that, you know, going through the pandemic has really shown me that um, there there is some things that I have to unlearn and also learn to be able to have a, a healthy relationship with um, people around me. Um, so some of the close or the communities that has helped me out was um, the individual pieces, right? Um, and recognizing that there's no community that is in inherently perfect. Um, and 
Uh, there's no community that's inherently perfect and that there are individuals out there who can see my identities. There are black folks, Latinx folks, indigenous folks, um, folks with disabilities, multiracial, uh, um, folks who have privileges and marginalized identities um, from different areas uh, who have been able to show me that there are people who are out there who understands my experience and that it's not necessarily a pocket in one specific geographic location. So yeah, as someone who has all these intersectional identities, I often feel unseen, um, but it's the community that makes me feel seen, if that makes sense. Yeah, for sure, that makes a lot of sense.